So what the hell is a rifle? And I mean, that seems obvious, right? Except the exact same thing without rifling isn't a rifle. But then we use rifling in things that aren't rifles. Why does this have to be so confusing? And welcome back to Bullets and Brass. Today, obviously, we are talking about rifling. And what we're talking about is going to be a little bit of a mix. Uh, We're going to talk about what it is, where it's from, how it came about, uh, and a little bit of the tech side. But we're not diving in too deep. This is this is not a in-depth lecture. This is more of a primer for people who just want to understand this core concept of modern firearms. So no one's really 100% sure of where rifling came from. Uh, we generally credit it to two gentlemen uh, Austrian and a German. We have August Cotter and Gespard Kohlner. And I'm probably butchering their names. My German is horrible these days, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, Cotter was later, uh, about 20 years later. But he's the guy who basically said, hey, this should twist, <laughs> which is a key aspect of what we consider modern rifling, right? If it doesn't twist, it's not rifling. Kohler came up with the grooves. He basically said, hey, we're trying to guide a bullet down the barrel. Well, we want it to stay in track. We want it to do what we want it to do rather than rattle around randomly. Let's put some grooves. And he did this in the late uh, 1400s. So like almost 1500, but the end of the 15th century, say. And he basically, he got that far. And then Cotter came along and said, and 20 years later, uh, but they did know each other. Uh, there was, you know, crosstalk and, and cooperation. <clears throat> and Cotter says, hey, turn it. Make it spin. We know that spinning, and they did know. This is not, they did not come up with the idea of spinning the projectile. Uh, Certainly archers have been doing this for a very long time. People had made crossbows, did rather than a straight shot, twisted the bolt as it launched uh, to get a more accurate shot, not just relying on the fletching to twist it, but actually the head design and even as far as running it down a spiral track, uh, a tube that was spiraled uh, to make it twist on launch. So they understood the concept. That, that much predates uh, rifling for a, a firearm. And clearly firearms have been out for, for centuries at this point. But just nobody had quite put it together. Um, and a lot of this, let's keep in mind, it's not even that nobody did anything. The reason nobody knows for sure if these two gentlemen are the first is that there are weird examples of things that are along these lines, but not really over the years. Like it, parts of it crop up over the years. <clears throat> and I think a big part of the problem is that the difficulty of creating this. The difficulty of doing this at a precision required is massive at their technology level. Um, Even in modern technology, this is a non-trivial task to make a consistent, accurate barrel over and over and over. There's a reason truly accurate rifles are are prized. There's a reason they're expensive. Um, The general quality level has definitely improved drastically, even in just in the last 20 or 30 years. But it's still a a difficult thing to do. And you'll understand more when I discuss why and how you do it. So you're talking 1520 uh, is really the twisted, grooved barrel. And they were firing a standard ball cartridge. Uh, Sorry not cartridge, round. 
So you hammered it, literally hammered it down the barrel. And then fired it. And it followed those grooves that you had cut into it down the barrel, spinning, to be a more accurate shot. But barrels were not particularly great at this point. The consistency of the diameter and the grooves was eh. <clears throat> But over time, this improved. The ability to do it consistently improved. And it became something that was often used by hunters for more accuracy when you only need one shot. You know, if you needed a second shot, you turned to your assistant and picked up the second rifle and fired your second rifle. In fact, one of the earliest terms, possibly the earliest, for a rifle is a Jager, uh, which essentially means hunter in German because hunters used these rifles before anybody else. Uh, it was something that, it was not practical in terms of rate of fire for any military applications at the time. It was not accurate enough at long enough distances that you were somehow safe from musket fire while using your rifle. That came later. We saw that uh, particularly in our revolution, the American Revolution, if you're not from America, um, and we saw that used by the Kentucky or Pennsylvania rifles, whatever you want to call them. But ironically, those are German rifles. Those were things created by German gunsmiths in the U.S. And, and they were using skills and knowledge brought with them. <clears throat> Germany led this revolution for a long time. Austria was right there with them. But this is the kind of thing that they were pushing this envelope for a long time. And it, it really wasn't until the late 1800s or mid-1800s that it became practical on a larger scale, as in relatively mass production and abilities to increase rate of fire. And the mass production was simply improved technology, uh, improved industrial skill, because it wasn't can you do it, it's how affordably can you do it, right? It's most things that were like, well, we would like to do that. If you want to do it once and money is no object, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's amazing what modern engineering can do, right? But if you want it to be mass produced at an affordable price point, that's extremely difficult for many things. And this was no exception. And again, well, well when you... When I describe how it's done, you will understand more about why that is true. So what revolutionized riflery for the military was the mini ball. Uh, Minier, however you want to pronounce it. Um, it is, and I'm probably getting this wrong because it wasn't the focus of my research and I'm not an expert on this. It was an American concept done by a Frenchman and then produced in America. Ian McCollum, Forgotten Weapons, talks about it um, in a couple of his videos and has much better understanding of it. Google it. Uh, yeah, not my thing. Anyway, basically, this is a, a musket round. It isn't a ball. It, it is conical, shaped like a modern bullet, really. But it's got a hollow base. So... It fits down the barrel fairly loosely. Like you can just push it down the barrel. You don't have to hammer it in. You're not driving it in. It, it is not cutting itself into the rifling on its way down the barrel. But when it comes back the other direction at high speed, the base of the bullet is open and has expanded into the grooves of the rifling. From the, from the pressure behind it, it has expanded. Because remember, lead is soft. It opened up a little bit because it had an open cavity for that pressure to get into and push it open. Well, now it's pressed into that rifling, so it spins, which let you load the rifle, as generally called rifled muskets at that era, quickly. You could load it as fast as you could a smoothbore musket, but you got rifle accuracy, which meant that instead of it being a to whom it may concern, it was a relatively precision tool. You could aim at a particular person rather than 
we're throwing a bunch of lead in their general direction and maybe we'll hit some of them. <clears throat> Ironically, this, this revolution in technology happened at essentially the same time it became obsolete, not rifling, but the, the mini ball concept. Within a few years, relatively speaking, uh, a decade or two, eh, cartridge firearms, breech loading became a common thing. Muzzle loading firearms became essentially obsolete for most of the world. So, eh, it is what it is, but rifling is what we're talking about, right? So, oddly enough, I can't find any information on why we call it rifling. And when I look up the term in German, they only talk about rifle. They use, as far as I can tell, they use that term. But rifling doesn't seem to have its own term. And I'm not, I could be getting this wrong, because, but I, I can't find any information. I don't have a native German speaker handy, uh, which is ironic given I'm in Bernie, Texas, which has got a lot of Germans. Uh, but I just don't know. And the term is basically discussing the, the twist, the grooved twist, not the, the thing that it's in. But common usage, now we call it a rifle. But you rifle things other than rifles, cannons, handguns, all sorts of things. So in order to be a rifle, it must be rifled. But you can use rifling to things other than a rifle. I love it. Uh, but yes, so generally speaking, early on, they used it as a, an adjective, basically. It was a rifled musket. It was a rifled pistol. It was a rifled uh, cannon, right? Uh, it was a descriptor to specify that this one's rifled as opposed to smoothbore. And yes, they did rifle cannons early on, uh, relatively speaking, uh, particularly polygonal rifling. Uh, but obviously, different languages use different words for it. Uh, rifle is the English word. Worldwide, rifle is pretty universal. Uh, very often, you will find that the word for rifling, just as I found in the German, is the word for rifle, for the, the whole object. And they, they just use the same thing when they're discussing it in terms of another thing. They add the other word to say, you know, a, a pistol, a rifled pistol, is a blah, blah, blah pistol. And obviously they use their word for pistol. But it does break down as you stray from, from English. Uh, but the concept remains the same. The technical side of it remains the same. Uh, rifling consists of two or three parts, depending on how you look at it. There are the lands and the grooves. And then the twist rate. But we'll get into that in a second. I'm not sure the lands count. Uh, and let's just say I, I'm in the camp of you have grooves and you have twist rate. Those are the things that make up rifling. The lands are the parts that you didn't change. They're what's left of the barrel before you modified it. So if you had a smooth bore barrel, it would just be the lands. Now, it would also be too tight for your bullet to fit down, but that's what you would have. It would be an undersized barrel. And then you modified that by cutting in the grooves or pressing in the grooves or otherwise modifying it. Now this breaks down again because you have other processes that don't work that way, but essentially the original smooth surface closest to the bullet, closest to the center of the bore is the lance. Um, and then the cut out portion so to speak, depending on how you did it, it may not have been cut, is the grooves. There can be different numbers of grooves, they can be different depths, different designs, produced differently, but they are the grooves. To me, that's the critical part, right? If you didn't have the grooves, you don't have anything, which is always interesting when you get into polygonal rifling because what exactly are the grooves? Um, it's weird, huh? And, and for a description of polygonal rifling, Good luck. Uh, it describes a multitude of things. 
and it can get very complicated. Anyway, so you're actually, you're press fitting the bullet with the lens and parts of it are not being squeezed and are fitting into the, the grooves. It's a very strange concept, right? In terms of how it's working. But essentially, if you try to fit a bullet down a barrel of a gun, a modern firearm, the bullet will not fit down the barrel. You, you can't get it down the barrel. You would have to hammer it. Because it's designed to be launched under pressure and shoved down the barrel, twisting in that rifling, and they don't want it to slip. Uh, it also gives a good seal for gas so that the pressure is consistent and done properly. So the twist rate is how fast the barrel rifling turns. Uh, in English and, and American society, we call this, we usually use uh, inches per turn, uh, 12 and 1, 1 and 12, depending on how you want to phrase it. Uh, but one full revolution in 12 inches or one full revolution in 7 inches. Uh, and the other way you can describe it is how many bullet diameter, bore diameters per twist. And I've never seen it done that way for uh, small arms. I've only seen that done for cannons, for large guns. Now, commonly, a cartridge will have either a standard twist rate or a standard range based on the, the ammo. Uh, it is the velocity, the bullet design, the bullet weight, and it is meant to stabilize the bullet in flight properly. You don't want it to become unstable inside its expected range envelope. In other words, by the time it slows down far enough that it becomes unstable, you are beyond what is considered the normal range for this round. Obviously that varies. Different rounds are designed for different things. But then you get into different design rounds for the same cartridge. For example, the right twist rate, the correct twist rate for an AR-15 is a hotly argued, not debated, argued issue. Is it 1 in 12, which is the original kind of standard twist rate? Or is it 1 in 7, which is what most of the modern ones are in? Uh, the military uses 1 in 7 commonly. Uh, and they do so because of the specific kinds of ammo they use and specialized ammo they use that requires it. But most of the ammo people use in these rifles, AR-15s and M16s and M4s, uh, both you know, civilian and military versions, <clears throat> doesn't need either 1 in 12 or 1 in 7. 1 in 12 would not be enough. 1 in 7 is too much. So is it 1 in 8? 1 in 9? Yeah. Of course, the obvious answer is it depends. What are, you, what are you shooting? What ammo are you using? Are you hand loading to what velocity with what kind of bullet? What are you doing with it? Um, now, keep in mind, the twist rate really is specific to the ammunition, not the function. Uh, a particular ammunition, if you know you're trying to stretch out the range and it may slow down drastically, you know, you're, you're lobbing the rounds out there, you may want a higher twist rate. There are complications with that, but you're, you're increasing the twist rate, which will help it stabilize even as it slows down. Now, rarely is that actually what you do, but it's, it's something to keep in mind. Um, of course, there are also different kinds of rifling and different methods to achieve it. I, I talked about this earlier that one of the reasons it didn't become common early on and, and really didn't become common until the late 1800s is the difficulty of doing this. And most of it revolves around the tooling and the details of what is done and how and how many grooves, the shape and all that it doesn't matter for the average user. Nobody gives a shit. Uh, really, it does not matter. Uh, it matters if you are a complete accuracy nut or you're really legitimately concerned with how many rounds you can shoot before it deteriorates, before it becomes an issue. Because certain kinds of rifling do last longer. 
uh, one of the reasons polygonal rifling is considered superior by many folks is that it it lasts longer. For for all intents and purposes, polygonal rifling, you you really have to wear out the barrel, not just the rifling, not just a little bit. Like, yeah. Uh, so it really comes down to what are you doing with it? What is the intended function? And price, because different systems cost different amounts of money. Different manufacturers use different systems. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds, but essentially there are three ways these days that they rifle small bore, small arms barrels. We're not talking about cannons. We're not talking about prototypes. We're not talking about weird, strange stuff. We're just talking about I'm going to order a new rifle barrel for my hunting rifle, a target rifle, uh, an AR-15 of some sort. Like just, I'm going on Amazon or uh, on on Gun Broker and I'm buying a barrel. I'm going to Midway and I'm buying a barrel. And the three ways are: you can press something through, you can cut with something, or you can press really hard. <laughs> and Pressing is what we normally call button rifling. And it, it really is, they take a tool that has little buttons on the outside of it and you push that through the barrel. And those buttons press into the metal of the barrel and they create little grooves. And you, you increase the size of that button until you get the, the depth groove you want. See how this might be a laborious difficult process to do in uh, 1600 when your barrel might not be quite the right diameter all the way through because if it's not perfect this is going to work poorly right so button rifling you are literally pressing the metal where you want those grooves you're, you're pushing it inward out of the way theoretically you might be increasing the density it doesn't really work that way metallurgically but people think it does, and there's some validity to that argument. Um, <clears throat> then you have cut, which is essentially the same process, but instead of a button pressing, you have a small cutting tool. And you can either cut one groove at a time or multiple grooves. And, and keep in mind, you're not cutting it all at once. Just like with button rifling, you're not cutting the whole groove at once. You're cutting the whole length of it but you're not cutting the whole thing. You are essentially scratching your way through a little at a time. And to do this, keep in mind, you're trying to make a consistent twist or if it's not consistent, it's something called gain twist where it increases the twist rate as you go, but you want that to be controlled. You wanna know what you're doing and it be a consistent thing that you are creating which means your machinery must be very solid, very consistent, very durable, and very precise. And that's difficult in earlier ages. Uh, these days, this is not technically hard to do, but the expected quality has increased and the expected price has decreased. Last option is actually the you're pressing harder is how I phrased it, right? It's called hammer forging. And these days, mostly cold hammer forging, but it didn't have to be. Uh, you could do hot. And what it is, is you literally take a mandrel of what you want the barrel inside to look like in reverse. So you have a shaft with your rifling already on it in reverse. And then you take the metal barrel and hammer it down onto it. You compress it down onto that mandrel, forcing it to shape with a lot of effort. A lot of, a lot of energy goes into this, particularly cold hammer forging. Hot hammer forging, you have a heated up piece of metal that is more malleable. It is much easier to do this. But you get a less precise result because the metal is still softer and it doesn't necessarily retain that exact shape afterward. Cold hammer forging, every hammer blow is driving metal into position that doesn't want to move. And then it doesn't want to move 
back. So very expensive, very difficult. Um, these days, it's considered a premium option because only a few companies really can do it. They, there's only so many of these machines out there. And it is an expensive process. So if you're going to do it, you don't do it on your cheap barrels. You don't do it on your, your crappier quality barrels. You do it on your premium product. Even if you're an affordable company, your, your lower end products are not going to be called hammer forged. So that's, that's pressing harder, right? Cutting is the oldest and the easiest uh, from a mechanical sense, but is also, generally speaking, the least accurate. Just for the sake of argument, uh, and, well, sorry, anyway, yeah, fine. The other options for how to create rifling uh, range from chemically cutting the grooves to uh, using a laser. And I'm sure people have come up with things even beyond those two ranges. Um, but generally speaking, it is still a slow, painstaking process. It is not something that happens, you know, zip, 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 done. Uh, these are things that are done very carefully and at usually relatively high cost. So that is my primer for rifling. Um, keep in mind, we rifle handguns. We rifle many things. Um, it isn't just rifles. But in order to be a rifle and not a musket or some other breech-loading smoothbore, you've got to have rifling. So take care. Have fun. Stay safe, everybody. Keep shooting.